put out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 423rd edition of Energy Week with George Harvey, that's me, and the amazing Tom Fennell in the flesh. In the flesh. <laughs> in the flesh. We're supposed to say that. <laughs> I know. I, I, you know, I was just robbing you of your, of your, uh, of your glory, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but I did say amazing Tom Fennell because you're amazing. What can I say? Okay. Well, we'll um, start off with a note that I have on the top of my notes that I put there because I didn't know where else to put it. What's that? Coal is powering the recovery. Ah. The IEA says that, and it's driven by China. Yeah, well, what what do you expect from China? I mean, the... the, the, the they have a know. lot of coal. They have a lot of coal, but they've got a lot of renewables. They're the, they're the, the power world powerhouse for renewables is China. You'd think that they'd know that. And in fact, they do. The problem is that the coal plants that they've got are, are in places where they're, where they're well connected to the grid and the renewable places are way, way out in deserts and countryside and they have to get um, transmission lines built. And you know, this change- So right now they're favoring coal. Right now they're just trying to get electricity to people. I mean, I, I don't remember how many years ago it was, but it was during the time that we were working on this show, maybe five, six years ago. Um, we we got a, had, did a very brief story about the fact that now, for the first time in history, China is actually delivering electricity to every town and village. And not to every well, that's, household. That's an improvement, yeah. It is. But, you know, they've been expanding their, their base for electricity like mad. And um, they've been taking what I regard as shortcuts in doing coal. But we should go on with the show. And if you don't mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead with the regular thing. This is all taken from my blog. The, the news that we have is um, from my, my getting it on a daily basis. The blog is geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com. Uh, from that blog, I take about three items usually every day and put them on a different blog, which Tom gets to so he can see what we're going to be talking about on the on the uh, on the show for the week. The best of the blog. Best of the blog. And then Tom the best and I. Of the blog blog. <laughs> and, then Tom, <laughs> and then Tom and I talk about it on Thursday afternoons. And today is the 17th. We are starting a week ago yesterday, which a week ago today, I'm sorry which is um, the 10th of June, and then we'll run it up to yesterday. If you want to see the blog that Tom and I work from, there's, uh, there's a copy of the whole thing in a, in a document that you can download, and there's a uh, uh, web address that you can link to, that you can go to, that um, will take you there at any place where you can download this, um, this show, or at least that's well, so, some of them are worth looking at and uh, I'll try to mention some of the better ones as we go. Yeah. So we should probably go ahead. Um, our first item is from CNN and oh, we have nice a picture there of solar panels with mountains in the background. I love mountains. Now it's interesting question arises. There's snow on the ground. There's no snow on the panels <laughs> and there's no footprint showing that people walked between the panels to get the snow off. Yeah, well, the panels, you know, those panels are, are dark colored and they, they warm up in the sun pretty quickly. They so, seem to be somewhat self-correcting, yes. Yeah, they are. Okay, what do you have for title for this? Well, let me, uh, let me slide it down a little bit. <laughs> Ohio yes. will soon be home to the largest solar factory complex outside of China. Yeah. How'd that happen? Now, how did that happen? First Solar unveiled plans to build a state-of-the-art factory in Ohio, doubling its U.S. manufacturing capacity. The factory will be the company's third in the Toledo area. First Solar is the only major U.S. manufacturer of solar panels. It will invest $680 million in the factory. It's interesting that First Solar is the only one. 
Well, yeah, I think isn't you know I could be wrong about this, but isn't First Solar the 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 company that uh, is owned by Tesla? I was just thinking about that. I was thinking about that exactly. I don't know the answer to that, but they very well could be. I think they probably are. This was talking about uh, solar panels. Yeah. Well, um, China largely dominates the U.S. PV supply chain. Yes, not it just the U.S. Most, it currently makes most of the materials and the parts that we use. Yeah, and not just the U.S., most of the world. Worldwide. Yeah, worldwide. There are countries that are trying to do all their own stuff. India is trying to be independent of China, which is hardly a surprise because India and China have always, you know, have for many years been com- highly competitive with each other. First Solar wants and expects that about half of its solar panels will be made up and will be made in America. And right now it's about a third. Yeah. They're expected to hire about 500 new workers. So this is going to be a significant plant. This is significant. Yeah. Okay. We should go on. Um, yeah, we should. We got a crazy picture here. I don't know what it is. <laughs> this is a picture of Block Island Wind Farm, which is probably the single wind farm we've had the most pictures of on this show. Um, yeah, nearby, you know. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you have for a title? This is from Renews. North Carolina sets an eight gigawatt. I'm going to say that again. Eight gigawatt offshore goal for 2040. Yeah. That's North, a significant goal. That's a, yeah, that's big. Uh, North Carolina has set a goal of 280 megawatts of offshore wind, fire, uh, wind power by 2030 and 800, 8,000 megawatts by 2040. To further the state's transition to a clean energy economy, Governor Roy Cooper issued an executive order highlighting North Carolina's commitment to offshore wind power. Eight gigawatts is a lot. And, you know, well, I've, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again, and you know what I'm going to say. I know what you're going to say. Gigawatts is gigawatts, <laughs> baby. Eight gigawatts of offshore wind power might be the equivalent of four gigawatts of nuclear power, which is... Well, we can, we can look at that because, uh, for reference, Vermont Yankee used to generate about 60% of a gigawatt. Yes, that's right. And now the new wind, new solar uh, nuclear plants are much, much They're bigger. bigger. But, you know, I figure on average they're probably a, a gigawatt each. So this is what they're looking for is is the amount of electricity that would be produced by about eight, uh, by about four large nuclear plants. And, of course, they're going to have to back that up with storage and solar. But that, well, that'll come. At least come. they're moving in the right direction. Yeah, I agree with you. Okay, our next item, we have a picture of Wall Street. And, you know, a Wall Street sign I don't know what's going on on that sign on the right side. It looks like there's a picture of Wall Street on that sign. I can't figure that out. I, I, I can't figure it out either. It, well, we got, I got to tell you that Wall Street is more symbolic than actual. Oh, yeah, of course it Most is. Most of the Wall Street firms aren't on Wall Street. I'll, anymore. I'll tell you, though, my father was he was in the regular Navy during the Second World War. And he was a, he was a naval officer, he served, yeah. uh, for, served on destroyers and um he in 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 the uh, let's see what year was it in the late 1950s he became an Episcopal priest. But in between the two of those jobs, he worked for a company that had the address One Wall Street. Okay. And he was selling mutual funds. Made a lot of money doing that. Okay. <laughs> what can I say? He took a he took a cut in pay to become a priest that was unbelievably big. It was like ninety percent. But here we are with an item from CNN, and you have a title for it. I know. Investors demand action on climate now. Yeah, now investors managing over forty one trillion. That is trillion with a T. T is the U.S. GDP. It's twice the U.S. GDP. Yeah. Holy cow! Um, it, it, investors. Twenty-one managed, trillion dollars is a lot of money. Well, I know. You know, if somebody <laughs> dropped it on 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 Elliott Street, it would probably make a big hole in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> But let me start again. Investors managing over $41 trillion in assets are loudly calling on world leaders to step up their climate 
game as quickly as possible so they can take part in a wave of investment in clean energy. This is money driving this. The investors, well, that, you know, you know, that's what's got to happen. And it's happening. <laughs> yeah. The investors call for governments to set more ambitious um, emissions reduction targets. You know, the more ambitious our reduction, our emissions reduction targets are going to be, the more money people are going to make more quickly. And the only people who are not going to make that money are people who are invested in fossil fuels. Basically, that's what these guys are saying. Yeah, it's like the fossil fuels industry or everybody else. So we'll see how that goes. Basically, this is a quote. Investors know that the impacts of the climate crisis are systemic. Oh, yeah. Systemic financial risks and will worsen if left unchecked i this is what's going on in weather is absolutely scary the the uh drought that they've got out west and the heat wave that's going on right now as we're speaking hey that's right i'm reading about uh, i've been reading about it it's not going to go away quickly no i don't think it is it might well, still we'll be, be there talking about that before the show yeah it might still be there a hundred years from now okay um our next item is in from renews we got a nice picture of a wind farm in Brazil. Yeah, and I don't understand that road. It looks like the Mississippi I don't either. River, I'm the way it winds. That same thing. It must have something to do with the terrain. Well, it might. Or and there it, is a road there already, an existing road. So yeah, I, I don't get it. Uh, you, you know, I mean, I could see them straightening out a, a road that looked like that in order to be able to pull those wind, uh, uh, wind turbine blades through. Without going through, but it, it doesn't make sense why they got that figure eight there. No, it doesn't. Anyway, this is from Renews, and you have a title, so let's just keep going. Enel starts a 716 megawatt Brazil wind farm spinning. Yeah, you're going to tell us what Enel is. Well, Enel is actually, I don't think we've got it in the in the uh, synopsis here, but Enel is um, is in fact the. Um, they're Dutch, aren't they? No, I think they're Italian. It's, they are. I think you're right. Yeah. And Al Green Power commissioned the Lagoa Los Ventos wind farm in Brazil. It's the largest wind farm operating in South America. Lagoa Los Ventos is now operating at full capacity, consisting of 230 wind turbines. EG 230, huh? Well, you know, it's we've got more than several, <laughs> more than several. We've got we've got a, several wind farms out west that are more wind turbines than that. Um, EGP is taking 510 megawatts of the 716 megawatt capacity and all the rest is going onto the free market. So there you have that, it. That, the, the, the lagoon, the Ventos, Ventos means the Lagos dos Ventos means lagoon of the wind. OK. So that's what that place is called. It's been called that. Okay. So in December of 2020, Enel started the construction of a new one, Lagos de Ventos, Ventos 3. Yes. It will take the capacity to 1.1 gigawatts. And what's a gigawatt, Tom? A gigawatt. <laughs> the entire wind farm is going to be big. It's going to include 302 wind turbines. You know, anybody who's listening to this show must know by now that Tom and I are at least slightly demented because we keep la- laughing at the same joke. <laughs> okay. How many chickens does it take to cross the road? <laughs> I don't know. How many does it take? More than several. Yeah, more than, more than several. <laughs> well, we got a nice picture coming up here of Hoover Dam. Yeah, well, it's a little bit depressing when you look at the bathtub ring. Yeah, the, Lake uh, Mead. The, the bathtub ring is there. Yes, it is indeed. We showed that last week. And um, we have, this is actually kind of, I think, kind of a depressing story. Well, it's a uh, picture of Hoover Dam, which has created Lake Mead. So that's Lake Mead in the background. Yes. And what and this is from BBC. What do you have for a title? Lake Mead, the largest US reservoir, dips to a record low. So last week we predicted this would happen. Yeah, and it's going to happen again. The largest reservoir in the United States has dipped to a record low, officials say, as an extreme drought continues in the region. That drought is just going to go on. This you know, this this is not 
this is not it's not going away next Tuesday. That's no, it's not going to go away next Tuesday. The surface elevation of Lake Mead along the Arizona Nevada border fell to one thousand seven hundred. Uh, I'm sorry, one thousand seventy one point five six feet above sea level, which is down. 140 feet since uh, the year 2000. So if you look at that bathtub ring, that bathtub ring is 14 stories tall. And that lake is that puts way it in down. Perspective, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And that lake is way down. It gets narrow it gets narrower very quickly. The walls of it get narrower very quickly as it as you go down. And I don't know how much I think it's like 30 it's 30 some odd percent of the water that they would like to have in there. And there's the drought does not have an end in sight. It, I just don't, I don't see it. Well, the uh, Bureau of Reclamation, the U S Bureau of Reclamation expects the reservoir to keep declining until November at least. Yes. And um, not good. No, this is not a good situation. This is rough. By the way, it's, it's feeding 20, 20 million people. Yes. By the way, as I as I looked at this, I decided I was going to do a little bit of um, research. Yeah. And and the thing that I that I was wondering about as I did this was Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco. There's a whole bunch of people who live on the West Coast, and it turns out that. Most of the population You're drinking water. Yeah. Most of the population of California lives along the coast. And which is not a big surprise, or on, on rivers that are very close to the coast. Where does Los Angeles put its wastewater? Well, it puts its wastewater into rivers and it puts its wastewater into the ocean. And San Francisco puts its wastewater into the ocean and San Francisco Bay and these big communities all up and down the coast put an average of something like. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to say it's like 100 gallons per person per day. Sounds like a lot. It does. But, it, you know, one of those cities, it was 80 million gallons a day. And for the for the city and I think a certain amount of surrounding terrain. And I was thinking. That that water is being is being released into the environment. It's treated. If they took that water and put it into basically man-made lakes, not very far from the coast, but farther inland, it could feed the 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 um, gra uh, the, the the groundwater. It could it could be used for irrigation. It could be used for all kinds of purposes, and it's it's not a huge percentage of the amount of water that they need to end the drought, but it's, it's a sizable amount. It might be two or three or 4%, but that's a sizable amount and some good could be done with it. And I, I just wonder how long it's going to be that they continue to dump water into the ocean. They're going to do it as long as it's the cheapest way to dispose of it. Well, yeah, except for one thing, and that is some farmer could co uh, could show up at a wastewater treatment plant with a 5,000 gall gallon truck and say, hey, guys, would you put some of that water in my truck, please? I'll pay you. <laughs> Interesting. <clears throat> okay. Well, of course, I have been at that exact location, and it's an impressive sight. What's that, at Hoover Dam? Picture. I've been, at, I've been right on that picture. Really? Wow. Okay, our next item is about agrivoltaics and we have yes, an item. it is this is a very significant uh development really i think this is this is really this is one of those articles that people should read this is from solar power world and you have a title largest u.s agrivoltaic research project advances renewable energy while empowering local farmers Right. This is a win-win situation. Yes, it and is. I'll indeed. mention it's a very good, interesting article if you got the time to read it. It's yeah. Reading. A study at Oregon State University estimated that converting 1%, that is 1% That's of U.S. Huh, what's that? That's not a lot. No, it's not a lot. 1% of, excuse me, of U.S. farmland to agrivoltaics would meet the nation's renewable energy targets, save water, and create a sustainable food system. A 1.2 megawatt solar farm in, Calif in Colorado is working on that. And what's happening here is these crops that are growing under the solar panels, actually a lot of them grow better 
with the solar panels in place. Well, I'll, I'll talk about that because I got some notes on exactly that. Good. Let's know. Okay. Well, I, first of all, let's define agrivoltaics. What a good idea. It, it's the co-development of the same area of land for both solar power and agriculture. Right. This is an idea whose time has come. Yes. You're getting two profit streams out of the same piece of land. Which a farmer really needs when you consider how difficult farming is. Absolutely. Absolutely. This a is the driving kind of... factor is the need to continue. What were you going to say? No, go ahead, Tom. <laughs> driving a factor. driving factor is the need to continue is the need to continue to build solar projects to mitigate climate change in the face of dwindling available non-agricultural land. Yes. And so agrivoltaic has been shown to increase crop production, solar panel efficiency, and, duh, farmer income. <laughs> yes. It also makes it nece uh, less necessary to, um, to uh, irrigate the, the plants. Okay, we should probably move on, Tom. Well, I'm just going to touch base on that. What's that? Well, let, me, let me give you a couple of quick takeaways. <laughs> give me a couple of quick, take, quick takeaways from this. Okay. Shade from the solar panels creates cooler, more humid microclimates. Yes. Panels with crops growing underneath them stay cooler by about 15 degrees and produce super percent more electricity. There you go. You and know, I will mention if you, if you got the time... Google Jack's Solar Garden. Very interesting website. Okay, and I, I want to say one other thing, too. The picture here was by a guy named Dennis Schroeder, who is at the National um, Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado. And we use an amazing number of photographs by Dennis Schroeder. I just wanted to, you know, give uh -huh. him a, a little thanks on that. Okay, our next picture is a picture of a praying mantis. And you have a title for this. He's this is, praying. I think he is. He's got his, his, his hands folded there. This is from Clean Technica. Oh. Biodiversity and climate crises demand transformative change. Yeah, indeed. A report shows that passing on ma maximally livable planet to future generations requires a profound shift in how we look at nature and economic progress. We need to, pri to prioritize protecting and restoring nature and dismantle economic systems driving carbon emissions. I think dismantling the, the economic systems dra uh, driving emissions sounds harder than it might actually turn out to be. Um, I think you're right. Economics has got to help us. Yeah, the economics, it's just a matter really of people have to focus on, on their economics differently. And I think really what it comes down to is we have to tell people that they they have to stop gaming the system, which is what a lot of people do, and start um, doing an honest day's work for an honest day's pay, which doesn't mean bad day, day's pay. It means an honest day's pay. And uh, there you have it. That's right. Really yeah. Okay. Well, you, according to the article, humanity must tackle the climate and diversity crises together yes. if we want to effectively address either. Okay, our next item. Support and need each other. We we are falling behind in our timing. Uh, our next item is from Clean Technica. Oh, hey, let's talk quicker. What's that? We'll Tom? talk quicker. We we'll talk quicker. We we'll talk quicker. Okay, Tom. <laughs> our next item is about a Tesla Model S uh, Plaid, and and what do you have? F for We're going to talk about this. In we're going to talk about this a couple of times in this show. We three times, I think. Um, go ahead. Right what's for three? Yeah. What, what's the um, what's the, the title world's here? quickest? The world's quickest, safest car, and most powerful computer on wheels. The Tesla Model S Plaid. This is this from is quite a car. It is. This is from Clean Technica. When it'll blow the people's minds when we get to the end of this, because we're gonna we're gonna be talking about this again. And okay, I'll just read what this says. The public and, needs and to again. respond 
to precedents and superlatives is a, this is a quote from from Elon Musk. He said that in 2012, the year the original Tesla Model S was introduced. Now comes an overhaul, the te- Tesla Model S Plaid. Uh, it is the f- fastest production car made. Now, pay attention to that. This is faster than you, you, you want to put it to a couple of million dollars into a car. This is faster. So, uh, well, we'll touch base on that as we as we go because there's more coming. There is but more. The, the way they can do this is got three motors. It delivers over a thousand horsepower. How many cars are there in the, in the Zero market? To 16. Zero nothing, to six. nothing, no, nowhere near it. <laughs> yeah, right. We'll get Zero back to, to this guy. Two seconds. Yeah, we'll get back <laughs> to this one. Okay, our next item is also from Clean Technica, and it has that picture of those things. Well, let's let's touch, 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 let's touch one more thing here that's very important. What's that? The computer will also play video games. Oh, good. The computer on the car will also play video games. Yeah. Okay. Our next item is from Clean Technica. What do you have for a title for it? Well, we got a whole bunch of uh, wind, uh, wind, wind machines, don't we? We do indeed. What do you have for a title? This is a good article. This, this is a very good article. <laughs> it's a good the article. Biden but... Harris administration. I'm about to say what it is. Yeah, go ahead. The Biden Harris administration proposes competitive lease sale for offshore wind development for New York and New Jersey. Yes. In support of the Biden-Harris administration's goal to install 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2030. This is in less than 10 years. The Department of Interior proposes... That's gigawatts. 30 (laughs) gigawatts is a lot of gigawatts. It's a lot of gigawatts. The Department of Interior proposed sale of offshore wind leases in eight areas in the New York Bight. That is Bight, by the way, well, B-I-G-H-T. Bight is an area. Right? I was just about to say what it is. Yeah, go ahead. It's an area of it's an area of shallow waters located between Long Island and the New Jersey coast. Yeah, that's right. And and a bite is like Who has been there? Yeah, a bite is almost like a harbor, except that it's really more open than a harbor is. And um I mean, a bay, it's a rather. It's giant triangle. Yeah, it's a giant giant triangle. It's almost like a bay, but it's more open. Okay. Um, yes, and we should go on. We're up to Sunday, June 13th, and we have a picture of the Tongass National Forest. And this is also from Clean Technica. This is, this is what uh, Trump wanted to, dis- wanted to just destroy. Well, you know, I mean, is yes, okay. What do you Biden have? Biden t- administration starts to restore protections, restore protections for Alaska's Tongass Natural National Forest. Yeah, in welcome news for native tribes, the climate, wildlife, and local businesses, a much-needed process to reinstate critical protections for the Tongass National Forest has begun, reversing one of Donald Trump's many environmental rollbacks. And, you know, he wanted he wanted well, to be... It's the largest national forest. Yeah. It's the largest national forest in the United States. Yeah. And it's he, roughly the size of Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts taken together. Well, that's big, isn't it, for a national forest? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Should we move on? Well, we're going to touch base with this on this again, so let's move on. Okay. We're also, we're back to the Tesla. We're just back to that Tesla. Tesla again. Yes, and and what do you have for this one, Tom? There's, there's a well, it's about a video. Yes, and the video shows you electric Ferrari drag race versus Tesla power versus twelve mighty cylinders. Yeah, this is they, I, they they took old cars. Those two are old cars. Yes, classic and, old cars, but they're yeah, old cars. And one and of they them retrofitted one of them. With, with with an electric motor. So basically, one of those is the, is a Tesla with a Ferrari body. Exactly. And the other one is a exactly. Ferrari. The other, with one, a, the other one is a Ferrari with 12 cylinders in it. Yes. And what do you have for... This is from Clean Technica. What do you have for a title? Well, 
Electric Ferrari drag race, test of power versus 12 mighty cylinders. Maybe you read that already. Okay. I think I did. Pity Ferraris are objectively terrible by the standards of today, but if there were some way to make a classic Ferrari somehow relevant again, how about an original Ferrari 308 GT with a, a Tesla drivetrain in it? Race that against a 390 horsepower Ferrari to see how well it works. Well, you can watch this because it's a video. So yeah, if, if you if you go to the clean technical link that you have provided, yeah, or Google Ferrari drag drag race, yeah, it's on you'll, YouTube. You'll get to see it. Yeah, and it's it's an interesting one to watch. Yeah, it's it, kind of fun. It goes into some detail about the about how these cars are set up. Well, we'll and, talk about that very shortly. Yes, we will indeed. Now we have. Um, do you have more on that, Tom? No, we'll cover it again. Okay, here we have a picture of the Kagoshima Nata, whoa, Nanatsujima, Nanatsujima solar plant. Kagoshima Nanatsujima solar plant. You have to go plant. home and practice that. I think I should, yes. Yeah. You know, I, I, when I was a student, I, I went to Columbia University for a while, and I knew a guy there who was studying Japanese. He, he told, taught me one sentence in Japanese. Uh -huh. It was, Anato wa baka. <laughs> which means you are a fool. That's the, that is the extent of my knowledge of Japanese. This is from the Mainichi. Well, it's a very interesting solar farm because it looks like it's, it's laid out on the water. It basically is laid out on the water. It's not floating, but it's, you know, they, they, it looks to me like what they did was they built an area up of, of land. Yeah. It looks like it's supported by the, by the, the, Ocean bottom. Yeah. It's not, like you say, it's not floating. It's not floating. But it looks like it's water cooled. It, yeah, it could be very easily. It would be a good idea to do that, it wouldn't would make it? Makes sense, yes. Okay, what do you got for, uh, for a title? Four nuclear reactors worth of renewable energy is wasted in southwest Japan. Yeah. There have been frequent cases in Japan's Kyushu region where the electricity generated from renewable energy resources, such as solar power, has gone unused. On some days, the capacity wasted is the equivalent of four nuclear reactors. And what they're talking about there is four gigawatts. Yes, exactly. This is, you know, the Japanese have got this problem of how do we switch over to renewable energy? And maybe you should start, you know, if you don't mind my making a suggestion, by using the renewable energy you've got. Or at least store it instead of just throwing it away. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Tom. Yeah, absolutely. So we can store now. As a matter of fact, that, that picture shows... Well, it looks like storage. It looks like storage, doesn't it? Yeah. I think they've probably got some. If they if they don't have storage in that, they should certainly build some. Storage is getting so cheap now. It just oh, makes, absolutely, yes. makes you sense. Can't, you can't not have it anymore. I've read that the what's called the, the storage adder um, is one cent per kilowatt hour, which means that if you take cheap solar power and you store it and then – sell that it's still cheap it's it's still cheaper than what you would get from a from combined cycle natural gas so anyway we are up to monday june 14th and we have a picture of beekeepers we got a picture of a couple of guys hanging around with a whole bunch of bees yeah and that smoke there by the way isn't to chase the bees away it calms the bees down yes it does it, it's, well, pet firms use remote monitoring to help honeybees, so they're moving into the 21st century. Yeah, this is from the BBC. Hit by a deadly parasitic mite, pesticides, and climate change, a survey showed that between April 2019 and 2020, 43.7% of U.S. beehives were lost. That's almost half of our beehives hives were lost in one year 
an Irish business, Apis Protect, makes wireless in-hive sensors that transmit data to website-based software so beekeepers can know which hives need intervention. So that's a move forward. I mean, it, it sure is. It's just letting it happen and 47% of the beehives are lost. Yeah, and what they're saying in the article is that at any given time, about 20% of the beehives are in some kind of trouble. And um, if they can identify which ones are in trouble and... and they can go to solve the problem. They can go solve the problem. A lot of times the problem can be solved. And, um, you know... By the way, I'll best give you a little statistic here in the U.S. Some of the largest beekeeping firms have more than ninety thousand hives. Wow, with ten to fifty thousand bees in each hive. Yeah, and yeah. here's another statistic: the global honey industry is worth about ten billion dollars. Yeah, and that's giga dollars, guy. <laughs> that's giga dollars. Well, you know, it was Everett Dirksen. Do you remember Everett Dirksen? I remember Everett. Yeah. Yeah, he was the guy who said a billion dollars here, a billion dollars there. Sooner or later, you know, some real money. you're talking about real money after a while. That was, I think, during the time that John Kennedy was in the White House. Okay. Well, we got a picture of Falmouth Harbor. Uh, and there's two Falmouth Harbors. There's one in Massachusetts and one one in Cornwall. Yep. That's the one in Massachusetts. I looked it up. Oh, did you really? Yeah. I went looking for a I went looking for a picture of Falmouth Harbor because I wanted to show a picture of where those guys were meeting in Cornwall. And here you're telling me that I failed. I got an F on this. Yeah, the Cornwall is built right up with with town, right up to the waterline. Is it okay? Yeah. All right. Well. Um, G7 leaders share a bold vision for a net zero future, but the devil is in a lack of details. Lack of details. You've heard the expression, the devil is in the details, and here it's in the lack of details. They're, they have told everybody what they want to do, but they haven't told anybody how they're going to do it yet. Okay, let me read the synopsis. There was an a there was some concrete progress earlier in the summit from G7 ministers and a vision laid out by leaders for a net zero world that would take a green approach to everything. But the final communique was lacking details that the experts had hoped for. And that is hardly a surprise to me because, you know, I don't think those guys had enough time to agree on the details. So well, and even if they do, the countries don't always listen to them. Well, the G7 is seven countries, so... Yeah, I'm just going to mention that. It's an intergovernmental political forum. Because it's yes. the U.S., the U.K., France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and Canada. My big How? question is, where is China? They don't want China. Are you kidding me? Or Russia. They don't want either one of them. China and Russia would gum things up. They need to have, you know, they yeah, need to... That's, that's, they're the enemy. The, yeah, and when you get to the G8... Then you've got Russia, you know, and when you've got yeah. to the G20, then you've got China. So it's it's not really like they're trying to exclude everybody. It's just that they have an agenda and the agenda is not China's agenda. And as a matter of fact, they're getting kind of down on China recently because they they don't you know that NATO, for example, is is talking about China being a, a serious problem. And when you consider the amount of money that China's been spending on its navy, it well, could be a problem. problem. You, you, you got a point there. Well, you, NATO is effectively a military organization. That's correct. Yeah, the the um, China. When I was a kid, you know, and Mao Zedong was the was the premier, they had a navy that had something like six hundred and fifty seven vessels, if you can imagine that. They had one cruiser, four destroyers. And the rest of them were all junks. <laughs> wow! I'm not kidding. It was a, it was a it was a huge number of of vessels, but it was I don't I, some of those junks. Maybe all of them were powered by by engines of one kind or another. But I, I'd say they were powered by coolies with oars. By what? Coolies with oars. Well, uh, you know, the, the most junks were actually powered by wind. But yes, they were. 
Yeah, they, they, uh, junk powered by wind, you're talking about green energy here. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. We're still right here with a picture of the Taisha nuclear plant. Yeah, um, and this is, this is a, uh, from CNN Philippines. And this is an odd article because, you know, I, I probably look at, I, well, I do look at several, uh, hundreds of articles every day. And this particular story showed up in a bunch of places. N- almost none of them were what I would regard as primary sources of, of news. Um, the, I read the, this article and I got upset. It was paid by the word. The guy took 17 words. <laughs> I think that might be the case. This is from CNN Philippines. What do you have for title? The U.S. affecting a reported leak at a Chinese nuclear power facility. Yeah. The um, U.S. government spent the la- a, p- a part of last week assessing a report of a leak in a Chinese nuclear plant after a French company that owns part of it. That, by the way, is EDF, which is the no, that's not true. EDF owns part of it, but I think there's another French company involved, too. So I have to be careful and say that might when I said EDF, it might be true or it might not. Um, the company owned of, quote, imminent radiological threat, end quote, according to U.S. F- officials and documents. And they were reviewed by CNN. By the way, the uh, the uh, Chinese government today, I think it was, just released information on this oh, finally. Yeah. And they said there are five nuclear rods in there that are damaged. And they said one of the things that they cited as a possible uh, cause of the damage was that something like a screw, for example, got into the water and has been circulating and scratching the cladding on the on the fuel assembly. Could be. Well, it's it's, nu- it's, re- it's leaking fishing gas. Yes, and and, and the government is. is- Hi, basically, they're hiding that. Yes. And basically, there's another thing, too, and that is there is a thing called a core damage event. And honestly, I don't know if this qualifies as a core damage event or not, but there is a there's a uh, kind of a street word that that means the same thing as the technical word of core damage event. And that street word is meltdown. And we don't know that this uh, plant didn't lose uh, some of its some of its uh, fuel uh, uh, assemblies because it overheated. We just don't know that. We all we know is that somehow five of them or possibly more got damaged. And, and they. And we also know that the Chinese government is trying to try to hide it. Yeah, and they when they, they talk about you know circulating uh, the, a screw circulating under high pressure, scratching these things and and opening them up. That's a problem, um, and but it, we we don't know we don't know what the the event was. We just don't know. So we've got to move on from here, if you don't mind, Tom. Well, we got a picture of Jay Leno. We do. We're we're back to the Tesla, and this is this is something that I regard and as absolutely fascinating. And on top of everything else, it's a this is a an article that has a, a, a video with it that I would recommend anybody look at. Well, you know Leno, and of course, what, what I don't know because I don't watch TV, he's got a show on TV called Jay Leno's Garage. Yep. And that is, explains why he was involved in this thing. It also explains some of the very weird comments that he made about this car. But what's the title for this? Jay Leno breaks the world's record in a Tesla new plaid Model S. Quote, I love this car. Yeah. Jay so for Leno. those who don't know, Jay Leno is a stand-up comedian with a big jaw. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and that's he is right. now a television personality. Yep. Jay Leno broke the world's acceleration record for the quarter mile in a new t- Tesla Model S Plaid. He was one of the few lucky ones to have driven the fastest production car ever made. Leno's new record for the quarter mile in, uh, in um, is 9.247 seconds, which means that he hit a, a top speed of 152.09 miles per hour. In a, quarter, in a quarter of a mile. In a quarter of a mile. So he went, he, you know, 
he, you know, I think there's a bunch of things people should understand. One of them is I think Jay Leno is actually 70 or 71 years old. I don't know. He's about that. He's got to be. Yeah. And we're not talking about a young man with fast re reflexes here. And we're not talking about a professional race car driver. I know that Jane Leno loves fast cars and he's got a bunch of them, but he, he just, he just put his foot on the, on the accelerator. And that was that. Well, don't... this is a quote that says exactly that quote from the minute you step on the accelerator, boom, you're gone. <laughs> But he, the, one of the things that's interesting here is he compared this with other cars. And one of the cars that he compared it with was the steam cars that were made in the, in the early first half of the 20th century. Because he's well, got some. The reason for that, because with the steam cars and with the electric cars, you get maximum torque at startup. That's right. And, and the other internal combustion engine, you don't get maximum torque until it, it basically reaches its limit. That's right. And the other thing is, he said, this car will beat a Bugatti that costs two and a half million dollars. But this car costs one hundred and thirty thousand. Well, he says exactly that. One hundred thirty thousand dollars is a tremendous amount of money. Yeah. But to get the same performance from an ICE, you would probably have to spend, in the case of Bugatti, two and a half million dollars. Yeah, ICE, well, Ferrari, by the way. Close to $1 million. Yeah. This ICE, for anybody who didn't catch that, is an internal combustion engine. Okay. We've got to keep going, Tom. Got to get, right, get back on. on schedule. Here we have a picture of the Cameron Peak fire. Which keeps on burning. Yeah. And it is from CNN. And this, of course, is a product partly of that, of that drought we've got. What do you have for a title? A picture of trout? drought i got a picture of the canyon peak fire that's right i'm saying this is a result of the drought oh i'm sorry I I, it wasn't a picture of a trout <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was looking for a fish <laughs> okay what do you got for a title high elevation forests in the rockies are burning more now than in the past two thousand years yeah. Following a devastating wildfire season of 2020, new research shows that high elevation forests in the Rocky Mountains are burning now more than any previous time in the last 2000 years as extreme heat and uh, is is hitting them induced by climate change. Well, this is expected to continue for several decades. Yeah, it could go to the end of the century. We've got the, in order to deal with this, we're going to have to stop climate change. And in order to stop climate change, we're going to have to draw down carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And in order to draw down carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, we're going to have to get it get to a point where we aren't releasing any and we're still releasing more every year. That's what the fires are doing. They're releasing carbon dioxide. Well, yeah, that's true. OK, let, let's escape from the fire, if you don't mind. Yeah, we got a cable laying ship here. Yeah, and um, this this is an interesting article from California News Times. UK and Norway complete the world's longest subsea electricity cable, which, by the way, is four hundred fifty miles. So they've got a they've got a, an, a, a power transmission line lying on the bottom of the ocean, and it's four hundred and fifty miles long. Bingo. Wow. The world's longest submarine electrical cable will be turned on this week as testing of a 720 kilometer, which is 450 miles, interconnect that can exchange power between the UK and Norway begins. This cable can carry 1.4 gigawatts of power, which is about the equivalent of a large nu uh, nuclear power reactor. Exactly. Oh, oh, on the large end. Very definitely. Yep. Well, this joint venture between the National Grid of the UK and Spotnet in Norway will officially begin operations in October. Yep. And but it's, they two, have. There's two more coming. The Viking link connecting right. the UK with Denmark and another link connecting France to the UK through the Channel Tunnel. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Our next item, we have a picture of the ocean. Do you recognize that? I've been there. Looks like an ocean to me. <laughs> a nice beach, actually. I I might not have been at exactly. Asking, yeah, I might. Day like today. Yeah, I I might not have been at exactly that place in the ocean, but I've been to the ocean. This is from Clean Technica. 
Marine protected areas are the key to our future. If we want our ocean to stay productive, which means we want to keep eating fish and lobster and clams and all kinds of things that we enjoy, we need to step up now. For decades, the ocean has been absorbing much of the global warming's heat, so it's warmer than, and much more acidic than it ever has been in the past. Marine life is searching for cooler water. Harmful algae is blooming and uh, a, a, and vital habitats are being destroyed. We've got to do something about this or we're going to find that we're in the middle, middle of, a, of a global puddle that is not safe to take food from. Well, there's an image on this site, which is not a, a, a picture. It's a, a statement yeah. of what a healthy ocean provides. Yes. And, and you got to read it. Yeah, go ahead. I don't have it. Oh, you don't have I, it. I would say people got to look up clean tech. Well, people things. should, absolutely, you know. But, I mean, we've, we, we eat an enormous amount of ocean fish, far more from the ocean than we, than we eat from freshwater. And we've got other seafood, shrimp, lobster, clams, oysters, mussels, you name it. Um, and this is, you know, and that's just the beginning. A lot of... A lot of countries you have, if you eat sushi, you're eating seaweed, which, by the way, is supposed to be very good for you. Yeah, it is. Well, they talk about marine protected areas, but they don't go into much detail about them. Yeah. They say they're the most effective tool we have for preserving ocean ecosystems. Well, we've, yeah, we've got to go way beyond that, though. I mean, we're going to, we seriously, when carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere, it, it produces global warming and the heat from global warming is absorbed primarily by the ocean. Meanwhile, when the, the temperatures going up. Yeah, when the carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere and rain comes, the rain will capture the carbon dioxide and wash it into the into the in, you know down in the rainwater, which means it, 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 it gathers. Where does it gather? In the ocean. So the ocean gets more and more carbon dioxide in it, which makes it more and more acidic because carbon dioxide dissolved in water makes what is called um, carbonic acid. Did you know yeah. that? Did you know that, Tom? I'll bet yeah. you did. That's, that's club soda. It's called club soda. That's correct. But it's But its technical name is carbonic acid. And it is a it, – it is an acid – that, oh yeah, and it it has its effect on the shells of 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 shrimp and clams and so forth. Drink and another thing; it will take away your teeth. Yeah, that's actually that is true. If you if you put your teeth in carb in soda water, and keep changing the soda water so it's always at full power, your teeth aren't going to last all that long. Of course, in that case, they're not in your mouth anyway. So. <laughs> Let's keep going. Nice picture here coming up of an oil rig. This is a picture of an oil rig. Yes, and it's going this, on the land, and it amazes me how they how it works sitting on a slant like that. On a slant? Well, the picture shows it shows the oil rig slanted. Yes, I think that's because the. I think it is too. It's the way the camera was held. Exactly. It's, um, it's it, a photography thing. Yeah, if you if you it wouldn't work if it was at, sitting at an angle like that. Yeah. My daughter was telling me that she said, you know, the, the, the leaning tower in Pisa was actually built to lean. I don't know if that's true. I never heard that. But that's what she said. She's, never she's heard that. traveled through that area. My bet is that she got that from somebody in Pisa. But anyway. Not against that. And she's a very smart woman, by the way. She's, she's got a doctorate from the University of Glasgow. Okay, this is from CNN, and you have a title. Federal court temporarily blocks Biden administration's oil and gas lease pause. Yeah, we uh, talked about that pause last week. We did. The federal court, uh, court has blocked for now the Fe uh, Biden administration's pause in on oil and gas leasing. The decision by a U.S. district court in Louisiana is a temporary order. That's why it said for now, the administration may be required to follow a schedule of lease sales set up by the Obama administration. I found that curious. They're not requiring a, a schedule of sales set up in, by the Trump administration. Well, they exist already. They're there. Yeah. 
Yep. And, and the reason for this is because uh, the states want money and they get money from the selling. Yeah, th- this is interesting. The states want money. They want money. Be- they get income out of the uh, extraction of oil and natural gas from these sites. And so if you ban exploration, you're banning them from having this future money. If if somebody went to the states and said, look, we're going to give you, you know, we're going to cover the, the amount of money that you need and we're going to employ those people doing something else. That would make too much sense. It would. They they probably would say, OK, you know, we're, we don't care about the oil as much as we care about employment and and income for the state. But um, I, the reason I bring that up is because it kind of shows how complicated this whole thing is from a political and economic point of view. Well, ultimately, it's all about money. It's it's about money. Yeah. OK. Our last item coming up to, picture here coming up of whirly gigs uh, for party t- favors. Right. We got what? Whirly gig party favors. Now yeah. what those are? This is from energy. Yeah, right. This is from oilprice.com. And what do you have for title? The renewable energy revolution has a major employment problem. Yeah, well, this is. Yeah, who'd have thunk? The seemingly unstoppable growth trend has hit a serious speed bump. There just aren't enough workers. The industry is expanding so rapidly that there simply aren't enough qualified and skilled workers to fill a huge swath of new job openings in the field. So if you want a job, well, they're there. They're there. Wind turbine techno- technicians. I was astonished. You need a lot of money. Well, I, I was astonished because I looked at the at the money that they were making. And the, the at the time I looked, over 50 percent of wind turbine technicians in Massachusetts were still in their first year on the job. And the median pay for wind turbine technici- technicians was over $52,000, which means over that there were people who were who were new employees in their first year and they were they're making still learning up, the job. And they're getting paid. 50 and the, yeah, exactly. They're 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 making over fifty two thousand dollars a year in a job that they just took months ago, which I think is kind of impressive. A quick takeaway here. Yeah. In the meantime, it's going to be a major growing pain for the clean energy sector. Yeah, well, they're starting job schools now. They are. We, I think we talked about that. Well, they, you, they, one of the articles that I came across in this last week, um, which, which didn't make it onto the show, was uh, actually about, um, I, think it, I think it might have been Arizona, where they, were, they, they had uh, a technical school was opening up a, a job program where they were just training people for jobs in a specific pl- Tesla plant. Ah. It was in Texas, as a matter of fact. Uh-huh. And, you know, these people who work at Tesla are not paid badly. So these are these they're they're out there hiring people. And um, well, I do know and I think we talked about it on a show down in West Virginia where they're co- closing coal mines. Yeah. They're retraining these people to do exactly this. Yes. And they've got in in central Appalachia, they've they've got over 500 mountains that have had their tops removed for for to get at seams of coal that were yeah. near the near the tops. And when those tops are removed, there's no soil on them. It's not like you can farm uh, c- corn up there. And the the um, people who have removed the soil are supposed to put enough back that things can be planted, but they aren't going to be oh. big trees. Yeah. So what do you do? Well, you can put in solar power, solar solar panels up there. You know, you can. And that's the, they're flat. They're flat, and they don't have a lot of shade on them because they're at the top still of the a very flat topped mountain that looks more like a mesa than a mountain but there it I, is. I was down in this is a long time ago but I was down in that country in Cincinnati Ohio working working uh, with mining yeah mining people for cables yep and I remember getting out of the, out, out in the morning and standing in the uh, a parking lot of the motel and all you could see around was clouds and sticking through the clouds was all these mesas 
That's right. <laughs> I checked to my companion, who was a local guy. He says, it's amazing, all these masons. And he said, they're not masons. These are their flat top mountains because they cut the tops off them. Yeah, well, this is, it makes me, it, it makes me cringe to think, you know, what's happening. Anyway, we are at the end of our program. And so we are going to wish everybody that they have an impeccably superb week. Y'all come back and see us. <laughs> yeah.